Hey everybody, happy Pi Day! This is Human Factors Cast, episode 33. We always got great stories here for you on Human Factors Cast. Governmental agencies and law enforcement are showing us all of their secrets. Autonomous vehicles are taking off. That was a pun. It's pretty fun, funny. And uh, <laughs> we can't escape artificial t- intelligence in the news this week. Strap into your smart jacket because Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. What's going on, everybody? How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm here, too. Oh, and Alexa's, wow, wow, man, all these mic levels. Uh, I can't, I can't multitask today. Alexa is here too. Uh, and, and she's in studio with us. We had a lot of positive feedback about uh, Alexa's appearance last week on the show. Uh, Blake, how are you? I'm doing so much better after that nice punny joke to start off the show, man. How are you? <laughs> Taking off. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. We, um, we have an admin note to start the show with. This is administration time. Do we gotta get up the uh, admin horn here? Hang on. Wow. Oh, that's not the admin horn. That's that's. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, Nick and Blake in the morning. All right. Uh, all right. Now we got an admin note here. Um, as some of you who follow us on Facebook and Twitter might know, we started being more active on our Facebook pages and Twitter. Um, we are posting all the breaking news and links about human factors. Add to all these articles that we talk about on the show as we get them. So live in the moment, you're getting curated human factors news from a variety of different sources. So if you go and follow us on Facebook, that's a great way to stay up to date with all the stories we'll be talking about on the show. In addition, we we encourage you guys to come on over, comment because the those links to those articles you can get. <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> I'm all over the place. Uh, Okay, two things. Two things, right. You can post links on those things, right? So if you come on over to our page, you can post links that we missed on on our page, and then we might talk about it on the show. Also, you can comment uh, on each of those articles, and if we like your comment, we'll read it on the show. We're trying to drive engagement here. We're pulling back the curtain. We want to drive engagement with you guys and try to make a podcast experience a little bit more interactive. Um, and just as a final note, it always kind of feels good to hear from you guys. We like to know that what we're doing matters and that it's not just me and Blake talking to ourselves over Skype because, I mean, sometimes that that's what it feels like. But uh, Yeah, I mean, hey, Alex is here too, so we got a little AI in the building. But yeah, please comment on the stuff or let us know what you think. Sorry, I can't find the answer to the question. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. No. I was, <laughs> you're really failing me today, Alexa. You suck. She's mad. Oh, she didn't even say anything to that one. All right. Okay. Okay. Yes. So Facebook, Twitter, it's all there. It's all. It's all uh, updating live in the moment. Go check it out. Uh, please. Please. Pl- I, I feel like I'm begging now. Please interact with us. No, but uh, go check it out, and and please do let us know if we missed anything or or anything you want to say. We can we'll we'll say it on the show. All right, but let's get into that human factors news. This is the part of the show all about human factors news. Now, this could be anything from artificial intelligence, virtual reality, automation, psychology, design, you name it. As long as it has to do with the field of human factors, it's fair game. Blake, what's up first, buddy? All right, so here on a wonderful Tuesday night, we actually have a story from Tuesday morning. So WikiLeaks released what it's calling Vault 7, an unprecedented collection of internal CIA files that catalog the agency's apparent hacking techniques. And while the actual code among its spilled secret has not been found, it's detailed surprising, it details surprising capabilities from dozens of exploits targeting Android and iOS to advanced PC compromise techniques and att- detailed attempts to hack Samsung smart TVs, turning them into silent listening devices. So I don't know, man. I was kind of surprised seeing a different three-letter agency on the 
WikiLeaks page, man. I figured this would be an NSA thing, but this was all CIA based. It makes sense. It makes sense. They need they need uh, some sort of access to that data too. Um, I, I, on one hand, I'm like, yeah, th- this is a thing. Like, are people surprised that the government is listening? I have a device in my house. And she's sitting right here. Alexa, say hi. Alexa, say hi. Hi there. Yeah, see, she's here. And she's, all, the government's listening to my conversation with her. And it's like, wow, this weirdo is talking with a with a computer. Um, and, and yeah, so it's there. It's out there. I don't know, understand why people are so, so surprised that uh, Samsung smart TVs might be silent listening devices. No, and that's like an old thing too. I remember hearing about that like a couple of years back. And I, and it is oh, yeah. the CIA. I mean, it's the intelligence agency itself. Of course, they're going to have advanced hacking techniques and I mean all of these pieces of software, even iOS get dropped with I don't know vulnerabilities baked into them without if they know it or not. I mean, so people are going to figure it out. Why not be the government that can maybe protect you from it? Yeah, I was actually listening uh not listening. I was reading through this and they actually have um quite a few funny names um i'm trying to pull it up right now um i got one for you yeah what's that i got weeping angel so oh. this was the this was the <laughs> like code name project for the samsung tv to use it oh. as a silent listening device yeah, no, some of these, uh, there's a there's an article uh, online, BGR posted it. They uh, said, let's all uh, have a moment uh, of recognition for all the amazing names the CIA gave its hacking tools. Uh, some of the highlights include um, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has an awesome sense of humor. Oh, yeah. Uh, Candy Mountain, Frog Prince. Uh, let's see. Velociraptor was another favorite of mine. Um, oh man, and some of these are Deluxe Burger, Godzilla's Quarrel, <laughs> Blondezilla. Some of these are just pretty funny, but I mean, uh, yeah, they they really got creative with those names. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, the only real takeaway I have from this one. I mean, people should expect this. Yeah, it came from WikiLeaks, but be careful with what you're putting out there for people to possibly take from you, like yeah. whether it's credit card information, how you're acting on social media, because it's as private as they might make you think it is. It's probably not. Well, yeah, and I think we don't we don't even um, we don't have this in our notes, but we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago on the show. Oh, excuse me, that um, that case with uh, how, how the Amazon Echo had data about the murder case uh they actually handed that over so yeah anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law even if you think no one's listening your tv is all right so now that i know my tv's listening blake what's up next all right so taser is back in our news stories again, again. so in early february taser announced that it had acquired the ai startup dextro a computer vision research team that claims it can use object recognition software to train officers to better discern actual threats to prevent office police officers from shooting and sometimes killing civilians holding harmless objects Dextro scans and pinpoints objects as well as motion information in footage that users are looking for and creates a timeline for when they appear in the footage, providing timestamps and frequency data. Presumably, an officer could take the four hours of boring footage, run it through Dextro's program, and then automatically redact everything but the moments in which the desired object or motion appears. Officers can then use this search. Officers can then search entire databases for videos based on these key moments like officer foot chase or traffic stop. Now, in theory, this sounds like a great idea, but if uh, reading the article, it brought like a very kind of dark spin to the idea. Uh, Yeah, no, they did. Um, But uh, just to go, I mean, to comment on that, police shooting people with presumably uh or, or, or innocent items in their hands this has happened with like a cell phone a bible even a Wii controller and it's just a matter of uh you know how you approach that situation 
and um, what kind of clues can you look for? So what they're doing here is they're they're kind of running an AI or, or running video through an AI that goes, okay, here's the interesting bit, and I'm going to go ahead and tag this footage with relevant information, and then they can go through and use these videos as kind of training documents to see, okay, this is what happened in this situation. What can I learn from this? Yeah, and the the part I really didn't understand, I mean, the the taxpayers have to are paying a partial amount of this, right? Because Taser is being used by police counties across the nation, right? And so now they've acquired Dextro, so it's part of them. And this ultimately cuts down what can be for like one piece of video cam footage from a police officer's vest for like an eight hour process to, I don't know, I think it says under a few minutes yeah, uh, as far as quick. scanning for things. So, I mean, it, it cuts down on the amount of money people taxpayers are spending on this kind of AI. Um, but people were pretty worried about like that. Now there's gonna be video all over the place and they'll be using it for facial recognition. So if you're, out and about anywhere and somebody sees you you'll be i guess your alibi would be lost if you had to make one i don't know nick did you, what did you think were the drawbacks of some of these of this technology because i didn't really see a whole lot the future's here man embrace it right no it's uh i mean one of the drawbacks obviously is that you like we talked about the other day you you lack that context um and they can set parameters to get that context and say okay Whatever this is, grab X amount of minutes before, prior to, right? Or, um, I mean, they're looking for movement and objects within these videos. And so, to me, uh, yeah, one drawback is that I don't know how much you trust AI, but I don't know. Like, I always feel like I have to go back and double check. And so, as I go through these videos, I'll probably be like, well, did they miss something in there? Uh, something important. So I don't know that that might be a drawback for me. And then you don't get that full context. Yeah, I feel like that's a good point. I mean, if this was to be used in some kind of serious court of law, I feel like the video would still have to be rescanned because you're right. Oh, I yeah, mean, for this sure. Thing is automatically redacting video. Well, what if you saw what led up to it is was there somebody else at fault? Is that the reason to happen? Ah, I, I don't know. There's there's good and bad to both sides of it. The thing that does worry me is that this is a startup company and like it's still in its growing phase. I mean, they talk about that throughout the article and it's just constantly getting updates. Um, and I mean, if they could say their article, they're not going to use it as any kind of malicious or like face recognition software. But I mean, we're, we were just talking about the CIA hacking things. I mean, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> talk about zero day vulnerabilities. This is a, a thing for that. Right. All right. Speaking of government agencies, what's up next? Oh, man, here we go. So while some still think of joystick wheeling aviators as the stuff of science fiction, that's no longer the case. A top general told reporters last week that there are now more jobs for drone pilots in the U.S. Air Force than there are pilots for traditional manned aircraft. The MQ-1 Predator and MQ-9 Reaper drones are set to have more than 1,000 pilot operators in the fiscal in the 2017 fiscal year. I could only see this as a massive positive because uh, I feel like this creates a lot of buzz around the aerospace industry, and especially in R&D, because throughout the article, they talk about how they're going to drop, I guess, production of Predator or the MQ-1 and start revamping and rebuilding new drone fleets. Uh, but also the fact that they're pretty much going to hire more people that are now, I guess, out of the line of fire. Right. Uh, so, I don't know. Yeah, what just, do you think? Well, just for comparison, that's uh, there's 889 pilots who fly the troop transporting C-17, and there's also 803 flying F-16 fighter jets. So, yeah, 1,000 drone operators, that is more than either one of those. So that's great. Although, if you combine both of those, you're still at a higher number for... Um, for uh, manned vehicles, but no, I think this is I think this is a great thing that we're getting those troops out of the line of fire, those pilots out of the line of fire. But also at the same time, this uh, there's uh, there's obviously problems with drones, uh, and I would argue that they all outweigh the benefits to flying a manned aircraft. Uh, the main one, obviously, is input lag. So depending on where you are, you might have to plan a route. You might have to um, you know, you can't be as 
reactive and it has to be much more proactive in terms of planning. So there's that, but also we're not losing as many lives. So there's also that. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, this like, this also allows people to do recon a lot easier uh, that it would be like having to take an F-16 out, spend all that much more money, drop, dumping fuel into the air. Uh, there's just a lot of different benefits to it. Um, the one right. thing that I do remember seeing a lot in the news at one point was that after a certain period of time, there's like a lag between like an operator doing their job and then r- realizing maybe the impact, especially in the cases of when it's like a, a strike type of thing. So I, f- I feel right. like the... Like understanding the risks of the job is going to have to be a really big thing, and especially like when you come back, how you recover from that. Because I mean, it's it's scary stuff. You're flying a, a drone, however thousands of many miles away, and you're shooting missiles out of it. It's it's a lot of responsibility. It is, it is for sure. But it, yeah, I mean, yeah, I have my thoughts. <laughs> All right, well, uh, what's what's up next? We got we got some uh, more autonomous vehicle news, right? Seriously. So keeping it aerospace, Airbus revealed its new concept design at the Geneva Motor Show this week. And I really encourage you guys to check out the video for this particular article because it is insane. Uh, The demonstration vehicle offers modular functionality, meaning it can operate both on the ground and in the air. And Airbus thinks it's one potential answer to the growing problem of urban traffic congestion. The concept vehicle is intended to work with others to form a network that can be summoned on demand with passengers hailing a ride from an app on their mobile device. The capsule-based design can connect to either ground or air conveyance modules, letting customers specify their preferred method of transit. It also... It's also designed to be used in concert with other existing transportation methods for maximum efficiency. Now, when I was reading this earlier to run through it, without looking at the video, it was kind of hard to picture, but basically it looked like one of the tiny smart cars that had like a quadcopter that was able to attach to the top of it. It looked really sick. It's as far as the concept video that was shown. This is awesome. Yeah, this is, this is really cool. I I think this is awesome. Like I am watching. So this article that we posted has a GIF uh, and it's literally a drone docking with one of these, what Blake described as looking like a smart car pod. Uh, and it literally just pulls it off the thing and flies it away. This is awesome. I can't wait for this. And, I mean, when you think of like a a, a, a drone that can carry a human, you think of something like when Billy was on the show a couple weeks ago, he he kind of was shying away from that because he I, I i get the impression that he thinks it might be flimsy you look at this thing and i'm like yeah that thing could support me the thing could totally. yeah i mean it's like a it's a two little two-person car with some pretty serious blades on top i mean it's got like four i guess separate rotors so i mean it looks legit it's a quad it's like, a full-on drone but i mean yeah, yeah heavy duty drone for sure no, this is this is awesome. I can't. I I was especially turned on by the idea that you can specify your preferred method of transit. So like, um, they uh they talked about maybe in the future potentially incorporating it into trains and um and rail railways and uh, uh marine travel as well. So so I ideally you could say yeah I want to go um to this place but i do uh, you know i want to go from san diego to new york but i don't i don't want to do it by air because i don't i don't trust you airbus so you can specify yeah do do uh trains cars and boats and then you know if you have a river to cross or something you can hop on there or uh you know let's say you want to get there really quick you can just i want to fly and i i would always pick fly man unless it's like expensive or something yeah, the the only part that I guess freaks me out, and I've thought about it a little more, so I'm not as hooked to this idea, but I've definitely gotten in some cars with, like, say, one of these rideshare apps and been a little freaked out at the way the driver drives. And if they were allowed to just, you know, fly the <laughs> fly basically a car uh, throughout space, I'd be a little freaked out. But at the same time, like, to f- operate any of these things, one, you probably have to be pretty certified in order to fly anything and well, carry 
I carry think, anybody's vessels and likely it's going to be ai that's doing it in the future just like most planes today well i think they there are they are just talking about automation i don't think they're specifying drivers i think it's literally just automation that takes which is easy enough because i mean oh, yeah. they've already got they're already moving towards like single pilot operations and they with most of that it was a lot of just ai in the cockpit anyhow so oh, yeah. it's a cool idea yeah no i agree all right what's up next totally unrelated but what's up next <laughs> Oh, for sure. So science has learned many lessons about what makes something addictive. Coffee, anybody? And now this knowledge is being used by the tech business to gain our attention and keep us coming back for more. In his new book, Irresistible, New York University associate professor of marketing, Adam Alter, argues that society is experiencing the beginnings of an epidemic of behavioral addiction. And uh, this could have dangerous and far reaching implications for us all. Now, this is a super dark twist on what I think is going oh, out, yeah. on out here in the digital world. <laughs> but I would be interested to read kind of from his perspective what he's seeing. Um, so he's he's a marketer. Uh, so he, he doesn't really I mean, he understands the human perspective from the marketing side of things. So, uh, you know, I don't want to, like, discount what he has to say. Because it it is really dark, and I mean it is important to kind of keep this stuff in mind. But I mean he he um he kind of mentions that you know when we use technology, for some people it's like loneliness and and uh, it, or or rather the uh, the idea is that when when you are lonely, you use technology and you get connected with other people through that technology, right? Like if you're on a MMO video game or something you're actually connected to a bunch of other people around the world, right? And then it could have the opposite effect where if you're lonely and you look at Facebook and see what everybody else is doing, you know, there's an endless feed of people having a great time and you're sitting at home doing nothing. So it's really fascinating to me how this, how this guy is uh, sort of framing this. Um, and he talks, about, he talks about design and A-B testing, which he, he makes this it's almost like he thinks we're malicious when we AB test where we'll take the ones that are, um, you know, the, we'll take the ones that are more engaging and we do, but it's, it's when we take these things into account, we're always looking out for the, for the, uh, best interest of the user. Right. So, yeah. And it's, it's odd to hear this from, I guess, a marketing perspective, right? Because I mean, his, a lot of, I would assume a lot of what he teaches and his job description are people that, Stutter under his study under him would be that you're trying to market a product and you want sales interaction and conversion and you get that from attracting people. Uh, so just the phrasing of that it's like an epidemic of behavioral addiction. I just I don't I don't really buy that. I think that the world is changing and how people interact with it is very different. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think it's all a bad thing. And you can put like disciplinary. I guess, barriers for yourself, like turning off notifications for social media and only checking it like X amount of times a day to Blake, keep, if you're worried about any of that stuff. Blake, we've A-B tested though and people won't turn off notifications. That, and it's clearly better for the user if they don't because, I don't know. This is, <laughs> I feel like this is really putting a bad name on us. But also at the same time, I get where he's coming from because there is a lot of concern with how we treat technology. Um, he uh, He mentions that behavioral addiction and this is this is true we've we've seen this but the idea um is that technology and behavioral addiction to technology could damage relationships between friends and romantic partners by replacing those face-to-face interactions that we have been programmed from birth to interact with other human beings right we have very specific mechanisms in our brain to recognize another human face we have um you know, we, we uh, analyze nonverbal cues. There's all these things. And when we're missing that, then it could also sort of, you know, go go in the opposite way. He also mentions virtual reality goggles in here and the temptation to spend time in an idealized virtual world. Well, I'm all for that. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, I think there's a lot of change coming that maybe he's not thinking about. I mean, maybe for our generation and ones prior 
this makes a whole lot of sense, but I just think like with the advent of VR and as it gets more integrated into our lives, just the way we interact with each other and expect to interact with each other, with each other will change. I mean, I understand that right now behavioral addiction is one thing, but right. I don't know. He's, it just seems like it's a, such a dark time or a dark way to look at things when I think this is kind of a, a very unique and fun time to be alive. Well, let's liven it up with another guy who doesn't want AI or technology or whatever. Oh. Next story. Oh yeah. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so Airbnb wants to mold its host into powerful organizing force akin to a union to advocate on its behalf with local governments around the world and serve as an ideological rebook to the advances of AI at other tech firms. As part of an effort to increase engagement with hosts, CEO Brian Chesky announced that he is embarking on a world tour. <laughs> that's an awesome term. Forming a host app advisory board that will provide feedback to the company and sit in on one of its four annual board meetings and do so do monthly check-ins with airbnb users via facebook live i think this is a great way for a ceo and a company to interact with the community that it's trying to build like using technology to actually let them in on some of these meetings that you might not ever get a chance to see unless you're higher up in a company like this I agree. I also think that this is, it's foolish of him to shy away from AI. Uh, basically, uh, he what he's saying here is that he wants to use the people to crowdsource ideas and to organize different um, structures within the organization. And that's fine. But why not augment it with AI? If we're getting to that point where AI is significantly more efficient than human beings at doing certain tasks, why would we not use automation? Like, to me, this is this is a great idea, but it's also resisting something that could help you out tremendously. And I think that these two ideas, both AI and getting sort of um, buy-in from your users and feedback from your hosts or whatever. I don't think these two ideas are mutually exclusive. I think this is a, uh, I don't know how to, how to say it. I think it's a cop out. I think he's just trying to make a strong statement against AI and I feel like there's no reason to do it. I mean, I could see, I see a potential reason because there's, there is a lot of fear that surrounds AI. Like what you just talked about, is it more efficient for this to be done by AI than a human? And that, potentially loses jobs right or puts people out of them and if you're not forward thinking and have a plan b that could be where this guy's coming from now what i don't understand is he's in the forefront of some of these big tech companies where if you're looking at any of the trends in our news stories for the past month or past few weeks or just in general i mean all of it is centered around ai so i, I like you don't understand the major like trying to fight back against it. I would think that they would want some kind of stake in where it's going. Um, so it's hard to kind of see his perspective. I think there's, I think he's got some cool marketing ideas in terms of getting people engaged with his company. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, for sure. But what he's doing as far as trying to drive it away from AI, it's, he's you should also, come on the podcast and talk to us about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's also, it's funny because he's heading, he's uh, changing his title to head of community instead of CEO, which I think is a, it's just a different business paradigm. And I think that's really what this article is about ultimately is that he's just trying to do a different business strategy that puts the people first. And I mean, that's what every business strategy since put the people first came out has been. So I don't, I don't know. It's just a different way to look at the same coin, different side of the same coin. What's up next? Shall we move on? Yes, yeah, let's do right. it. We're still talking about AI. <laughs> yeah, just so much so much AI this week. And this name is killer. So meet Hugging Face, a new chat bot app for bored teenagers. The New York-based startup is creating a fun and emotional bot. Hugging, Hugging Face will generate a digital friend so that you can text back and forth and trade selfies. Lonely much. But playing with Huggy Face was a lot more engaging than talking with a customer support bot. That's good because that's pretty boring. Like other companies, Huggy Face doesn't want to be useful and wants to create a, dig a fun digital companion. Now, I don't know about you, Nick, but if I was a teenager and there was something called Hugging Face, I don't think I would go and download it. 
Really? What if no? What if it was the hot new thing? Um, yeah, maybe if it caught on like wildfire, perhaps. And it would probably be funny just to use, but it just seems like an odd name for, I guess, the demographic they're trying to target, which are angry teenagers. Yeah, well, so this uh, this emerged. Okay, so I, I have a feeling that this, a need for a digital AI companion has emerged from our lack of uh, being able to find people to engage with so this goes back to um oh what's his name adam alters adam alters uh book right where he's talking about all these uh problems with behavioral addiction i feel like this this comes out of that need to interact with other human beings and or or just interact with somebody that reacts that's reactive to you right because traditional human computer interaction has been user provides input computer provides uh output and so this is all it's it's the same thing but it's a it's tailored to your own unique experience and i have i have in the notes here adult friend finder uh and uh what that is all about is i've often joked about adults need uh because it's so hard for some of us to get out there and actually interact with other human beings that we need this app that helps us find other adults that we want to be friends with we can call it adult friend finder. And so, uh, but that name was taken. So <laughs> I, uh, I feel like this comes out of that need though. And, um, really though, cause I mean, I mean a lot of, it's pretty simple to hop on Twitter and I don't know, look for a hashtag that interests you and interact with people that way. And I mean, same thing with Instagram. I mean, you can post stuff up and tag a bunch of people in it that I don't know, you like like i do that with fitness stuff all the time yeah but and it, you can still get the interaction with people pretty easily but I, I don't know about you but i i just feel like the internet is just a big pissing match and it's like whoever can you know everyone just wants to word vomit and it's not deep interaction what i feel like this is is i feel like this is the precursor to uh iron man's jarvis or um you know any of those ais that you see in movies good old cortana yeah that you actually fully interact with and they could be potentially as good as a human being in terms of companionship. And so I feel like this is that first step, just a chat bot. So I don't know. I, I like the idea. I I'm less critical of it than you are. Um, and honestly, if I could, this is not, <laughs> if I could sit here and have a chat with Alexa, you know, I would. And, she we could just talk back and forth and back and forth and uh she's blue right now she's might say something no but we could just talk back and forth and that would be cool um i don't know like i i i think it's cool i think the idea behind talking to computers is cool if they have their own personality and what the, what hugging face sounds like it does have its own personality a little bit anyway well, we'll have to try it out. <laughs> we will. We'll leave a review for it. <laughs> That's, okay. It's a cool idea, but, I, you know, I don't know. Anyway, Blake, ready to go? More AI. Oh, so much AI. Okay, so Google security AI has become so smart, it can now tell whether you're a human or a robot without asking you to check a box or solve any annoying puzzles. I actually kind of like those. Google says its AI, or what it calls an advanced risk analysis engine, has gotten so good it doesn't even need a recaptcha ch- a, need the recaptcha checkbox. The invisible recaptcha is assigned to something to some existing button on the site and works hidden in the background to figure out if you're a real person. Whoa, that's interesting. That means that most people won't even know there's a security check going on. The only only the most suspicious traffic will be asked to solve a puzzle, but developers can alter this behavior to some degree. Now, this, I don't know. I feel a little bit double-edged sorty about that one because I, I remember when recapture became a really big thing uh, that it was being used to like help identify like different words to be re-put back into things like Duolingo uh, to help like uh, break down... Uh, different phrases and things like that. 
Uh, so I don't, and then and then it was also being used for some of the background of maps and things like that, ri- as far as like reading signs and stuff right, like, like that. which one of these are signs or which one of these yeah. are, are part of a house or something like that. So so you miss, I, you just missed the game part of it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, I kind of enjoyed it. it, although it would drive me nuts if I missed it or something like that and had to retype it. Right. Well, I so first off, I just found out what CAPTCHA meant when I read this, <laughs> uh, and the acronym is kind of cool. Uh, so I'm going to read it: completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. Oh yeah. So. Basically, yeah, they're just implementing this thing. I think it's cool. The more you can hide behind the scenes is one less barrier for the human being. I always find it annoying when I have to click on that stupid box and say, yeah, I'm not a robot. Can't you tell I'm not a robot? Um, so they've basically gone from saying the, the the AI can say within this box, you know, now, now they embed it into another box somewhere. Um and the way they basically look at it is, you know, computers will click right in the center of buttons. Humans do not. Humans click in uh, a variety of different places, and the browsing pattern is different than a bot. So they actually are just hiding it better, and I, I like that. But isn't that interesting what you just said right there, right? So if we've got that human behavior is, is of course, much more variable compared to a compared to a bot but now you've got so many companies that are using data to go through what they call deep learning to basically learn over and over i mean would it eventually get to the point where even a bot could mimic so close to a t to get past something like this i mean why i would be doing that i have no idea but it's it's an interesting interesting thing that AI is getting just so, I don't know, so engrossed in all the technology that there is from healthcare to something as simple as reCAPTCHA. Potentially, Blake, but then also Google's new CAPTCHA, new, what are they calling this thing? The AI security, what is this? They're they're calling it. Uh, I, I, I'm blanking on the name. The invisible reCAPTCHA? The invisible That's reCAPTCHA. What, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. The the smarter bots get to fool this thing, the smarter that invisible recaptcha is going to get. So, and and they they even talked about this original captchas where you had to put in those um those words, right? They had to get rid of that because bots got too smart. And then they put in the checkbox, and then there were different patterns. So, yeah. So so now they're they're basically just stepping it up again and it'll get stepped up again and now it's just hidden to the user that's that's my perspective on it yeah it's great i mean like you said one less thing for the user to have to worry about to get what they need okay let's get to my favorite story this week (laughs) okay so next time you place an order at a fast food joint you could see a robot behind the counter flippy is an ai driven kitchen assistant that can flip burgers and place them on buns and it debuted this week at cali burger restaurant in pasadena california flippy uses cameras sensors and deep learning software to locate ingredients in the kitchen without needing to reconfigure existing equipment not only does it position and flip patties it tracks their temperature and and cooking time too when the burgers are done, it alerts the human cook who applies the cheese and other toppings. This is like a cooking thermometer on steroids. It's just doing all the good work for you. It's too awesome. Hello, my name is Alexa. Welcome to Burger King. How may I take your order? <laughs> Whopper, please. Yes. No, this is... I love this. I love this story. It's so cool. Um, obviously, a lot of people's first reaction is, they took our jobs. Um, but, uh, honestly, let's, let's get that workforce out there doing something a little bit more mentally challenging. Let's get, you know, all the, all the manual labor out of it and, and start taxing our America's workforce mentally and getting them smarter and better prepared for all these, uh, jobs that require thinking. This is, this is my perspective on it, but also robots are flipping burgers. (laughs) That's just, is too incredible. And like I had put in the side notes that I had also seen a story recently this week that I think it's Uber Eats or it's Dine and Dash has now got road robots that they'll just let p- 
pick up the food from the food vendor and drive it to the person's house who has ordered it. So it's this is only becoming more and more real that we're going to see robots everywhere. Right. Although this, so this has actually been around for a while, though. There's a company called Moly, M-O-L-E-Y, and they actually have a robot that is like a kitchen assistant, and they actually cook. Um, you like... You select from a screen, you know, what you want, and then the robot will actually cook everything in the pan for you right there in front of your face. And it just hangs down from like a range hood or something. Um, but yeah, so this this idea is uh, is not new, but the implementation into a fast food restaurant is. And I'm this is pretty close to me. Pasadena, California is probably like maybe 45 minutes. I am going to go check it out, I think, because uh that sounds awesome. I want. I just want to it, see the. I want to see it. Yeah, seriously, seeing that thing in action's got to be awesome. Oh my gosh! All right, let's move away from my favorite story. What's What's up next? All right, so we return to Google, but Google's bringing us a little fashion this week. So it's been nearly two years since Google and Levi's announced their plan to work on a connected garment. The p- The first piece of this project is a connected jacket called the Commuter, which uses Google's jacquard technology to turn its denim fabric into a gesture controlled canvas a panel at south by southwest titled beyond the screens the ubiquity of connectivity google and levi's revealed that the smart trucker jacket will arrive this fall for 350 dollars the commuter comes with a bluetooth cuff bluetooth cuff that pairs with a smartphone to let you get directions adjust the volume on your music or answer the phone answer a phone call all triggered by finger swipes on the jackets fabric you know what nick i've been waiting for this now i can finally answer my phone with my jacket sleeve this thing looks slick too i like it it really does i want one it's tripping me out it looks awesome (laughs) oh there's a video i did not watch the video hang on i don't know how, how long is this 51 seconds an american icon with technology woven in oh it's probably just Probably just music. All right. Well, I'll stop playing that. But no, this thing looks awesome. I uh, I've wanted one of these for a long time. Not not necessarily um, a jacket, but I would totally buy this thing. So let me just give you a, a little side story. When I used to ride my motorcycle uh, for a commute, I always wanted a Fitbit or a smartwatch. So that way, when you're riding on a motorcycle, obviously life and death, you don't want to. Um, you don't want to pull out your phone to look at who's calling, but you can spare a quick glance to your to your smartwatch and see who's calling and see, oh, this is important. I better pull over and answer it, or it's okay. I can just keep going. So, um, so something like this would be even better because then you could potentially respond uh, by you know providing a gesture where you can't do that on a smartwatch. Maybe you can. I don't know, but uh, the the application of this seems to me infinite. Um, or, 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 or at least, you know, in, in the future potentially could have a lot of cool applications. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I really dig the gesture control canvas idea because I mean, now you're pretty much like taking the smartphone screen and just thinking about like small, maybe small interactions with the wrist or like the cuff of the jacket or something like that to pump up your volume or to answer the phone so right props so, to google levi's i mean I, I can only imagine this is gonna get bigger ah so yeah this guy is like i'm watching the video now and he's on his bike and he's like swiping up and right and left to adjust the music that he's listening to and adjust the directions that he's going to to get um you know and he's dismissing calls and and uh yeah man this thing looks sweet I want one. 350 bucks though. That's not bad. I'll totally buy that. There's yeah, some jackets first that are gin. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. All right. What's up next? All right. So Facebook and Oculus are making it a bit easier to share VR experiences with your friends and family. Alongside a host of social features, Oculus showed off an update to its Gear VR platform that will allow users to share live gameplay of their virtual reality sessions directly to Facebook. The feature is meant to increase the visibility of VR content and allow people to better showcase their friends what they're playing what playing VR is like. And all I have to say is one of us has got to break into the Oculus because this sounds like a fun thing to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they, trying to describe how VR feels is um, pretty 
hard to do, right? Like, uh, did you ever try out? Yeah, you did try out the PlayStation VR when you came over. Um, I did, and honestly, it's uh, it is one of those things that it's hard to explain the experience because I didn't expect for it to be anywhere near the fidelity it was, or right. I don't, I don't know. There was just such a like a seamlessness to it's it. It's the scale, I think, is what people are like. It's one thing to look at an environment on the TV, and then it's another thing to be in that environment and look around. It's like the same thing when you take a picture of a beautiful landscape. You're like, oh, man, crap, I can't ca- I can't capture the way this looks to my eyes because you're getting that full periphery. You're getting that full, like, sensory experience. And it's hard to recreate that on just a flat 2D image, you know, that you're looking at on your phone. So... This is cool because this is basically gonna, it's like a it's like a share factory for VR content and you can basically say hey look check this out and then somebody else can go put on your VR glasses and go yep no that's that's really cool. I think it's it seemed like a lot of fun especially to like be able to share it with people who may not be into it but see you like having a good time might get them hooked on it you know. Oh yeah. Just yeah. another way to share games, right? Oh yeah, for sure. All right, what's up next? All right, so a little bit more of sharing things. So a team from Google's internal incubator, aptly named Area 120, has launched Uptime, an app that lets you watch videos together with your friends. The app has a youthful, lively design that includes reaction features inspired by live streaming services such as Twitter's Periscope and Facebook Live. You will be able to comment or use emojis, emojis to react to the video, which will be displayed to anyone who watches the video, even if they're watching it at a later time. Uptime is designed for more public socializing that takes place around video content. Uptime is currently only an invite, is in invite only mode, but using the code word pizza gets you in for free. For Human Factors cast listeners. (laughs) There you go. Thank you, Google. Right. Uh, Blake, this reminds me a lot of Updog. Okay, you're going to have to tell me what Updog is. Hang on. What, what was that? Sorry. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Ah, <laughs> old joke from the office. All right. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to say, what's up, dog? <laughs> Nothing much. How are you? Uh, okay. No, this is, uh, this is, I can't wait to watch YouTube. Like, this is one thing. So, my buddy and I used to watch TV shows together all the time. And then he moved up to Santa Monica to go work at Riot. And then I, uh, I stayed in San Diego. And we we could never communicate to watch our shows together. But, you know, with all these all these apps, Hulu, YouTube, uh, making it easier to share experiences with other people. This is nice because you don't have to be in VR like Hulu's app. Right. This is we talked about that a couple of weeks ago on the show. This is more along the lines of we're watching it synced or unsynced. But you get to see my reactions as things happen on the screen, which is great. I love this idea. I do too. Like when I was reading this earlier, I couldn't help but go and download the app because uh, I, I wanted to try it out. The whole idea of being able to sit there and either share it with people you might not know or share it with like some of your friends. Like you were talking about watching the same TV shows with your buddy you used to, used to do, but you can't do because you're now separated. Well, so the power of the Internet might let you do some of that. stuff. Right. So you have the app. You're you're all good to I go. I do. So all good to go. So if anybody's looking for me, it's just it's the same as my Twitter handle. It's don't panic UX. Uh, and I don't know, tag me, let you know, let me know you've watched something of mine or whatever, and I'll follow you and watch some of your reactions and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Go go watch YouTube with uh, with Blake. I might hop on there too. Um, yeah, I'm I'm trying to get more involved in the social scene. I might start streaming Twitch. Uh, sometime soon, so stay tuned for that. I might actually put Human Factors Cast up on Twitch. I don't know. It'd be kind of fun. Do you have a webcam? I do. Sweet. We could totally do it. Yeah, uh, we should. I think it'd be fun. I agree. I agree. What do you guys think? Do you think we should uh, stream on Twitch? Let us know. All right, what's up next? All right, so this one this one makes me wish Billy was in the room, but anyway, here's for you, Billy. I know. So I coming soon wouldn't... to PC, tablets, and phones, D&D Beyond is the official digital companion to the 5th edition D&D, giving players and dungeon masters instant access to the rules, character builders, and more. D&D Beyond aims to deliver a wealth of information and utility to players, like, players and DMs alike. D&D Beyond is launching later this year, and you can sign up for the beta at their website. 
I, so, I don't know. This seems super sick because I don't have any of like the, the books or any of that stuff anymore, and I would love to brush up on it and grab some people to play it together with. Oh, man. We should... Oh, dude. I just thought of one of the ex- most excellent Patreon uh, subscriber bonuses. You get to play a and d game with Human Factors cast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, there I need to put that up there. Uh, but yeah, no, this is... Uh, I put this up there for Billy, and I'm really, I'm really bummed he couldn't make today's show... Uh, for those of you wondering, Billy um, will not be joining us for a while. He's got a lot of stuff going on in his personal life. I mean, the dude's getting married, so he had to kind of step down for a little bit. He might be back, um, but be sure to send him all your love at Comstar Cleric. Let him know that we miss him, and uh, uh, you know it's gonna, it's going to be hard without him on on Human Factors Cast, being the voice of the everyman. But yeah, no this this is something that I I think that we should definitely try. Uh, what I'm most excited about is um, so traditionally in these apps they've kind of companion apps have kind of sucked like they they haven't been good but Wizards of the Coast has actually been really good with their content and the the type of things that are being offered here rules character builders and more um, and it offers me or it tells me that it sh- it should be the information that users gamers are going to want to access and what is awesome to me is that they are designing it to appeal to both type of people players and dungeon masters so this is really good a really good example of one of those uh dual user or multi user um apps that they're they're trying to design for both both sort of uh parties and I like that they're going to drop it on multiple platforms, and it sh- it'll be great to see what what they do as far as how they lay out the content, because as far as I know, there's a lot of just stuff to read and things like that, so they, uh, they have a lot of opportunities to put some cool designs in place. Right. I'm worried that they're going to put content behind a paywall, but we'll see. Very true. But, yep, you're right. We'll see. Sign up for the beta. Hey, Blake, have you gotten any uh, weird texts from 2003? Oh man, I have personally not, but I have seen this all over Instagram. <laughs> have you? <laughs> yeah, so all right. So what are we talking about? Redditors are going crazy over mysterious SMS M- eh, excuse me. It's okay. SMS text <laughs> message that appears to have been sent from 2003, except for it wasn't. Reddit user Nihilus 89 posted a screenshot showing an SMS she received on March 9th this year. But the message was dated from September 8th, 2003, almost 14 whole years ago. More worryingly, the text contained absolutely no message and came from a non-traditional 26-digit number. It quickly became evident that Nihilus 89 wasn't the only one to have been contacted from the past. Hundreds of people have reported receiving similar texts from 2003 over the past few months with complaints dating back as far as October 2016. These time-traveling texts seem to be a result of a vulnerability in the PDU texting format that makes it possible to fake absolutely everything about an SMS. Uh, Go figure there. So in case you've been getting cryptic messages from the past or the future, your best course of action is to delete and report them to your mobile carrier or simply ignore them and move on. This is just too funny because literally I've seen this over and over on like the search function in um, in Instagram and it's pretty funny people reacting to it. Yeah, uh, I would be freaked out. I'd be like, am I trying to tell myself, my future self something? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, this it's being sent by a weird number first off and then second off, no text. It just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, it would have made me think it was something malicious with it being sent from obviously like an auto generated type number or potentially one, and then it being from 2003, but it having no message content, that would make me think that there's something weird going on. Oh, yeah. Um, but lucky enough, it's just people that are able to fake it, um, which again is a little sketchy because if you're able to fake absolutely everything, as the article claims. What if you knew somebody's phone number, my name, my phone number, enough about me to fake me? That's that's pretty scary. Yeah. Yep. 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 (laughs) Pretty much. Oh, man. All right. Well, shall we end this on a silly note? This is not silly. All right. Go ahead and talk about it, though. All right. So have you ever been using your iPhone and found yourself wishing it was heavier and more prone to viruses? 
Well, we've got a gadget for you. The iSmart iPhone case crams a whole other phone onto your phone. The case is essentially an Android phone that the iPhone plugs into. It can allegedly use the iPhone's internet connection. If you pledge $95 on this Kickstarter for for the case without its own internet connectivity, and a $129 pledge reserves one that can connect to the internet on its own. And Nick, you're right. I said this was silly, but actually I think this is kind of a great idea. But what are your thoughts? I love it uh, because iPhone is terrible, and <laughs> and uh, any way you can fit an Android on an iPhone is is good in my book. No, um, I think, so I can see it where, um, I can see situations where this would be handy. Uh, like let's say, let's say there are apps available on Android that you can't get on iPhone, which there are, uh, le- like podcast addict. And you want to listen to your human factors cast with specific settings on podcast addict, but your iPhone doesn't have it. Uh, this is almost like having two devices in one. Uh, for me, what I would do with this is I would record with one and then use uh, the other for like a phone, right? So one is dedicated to a phone and then the other one's dedicated for recording. There's there's a ton of different situations where you can use both of these in tandem or independently of each other. And although it sounds really stupid to put another device on there, like I can I can totally see where it'd be useful in certain situations. Honestly, I think this is nothing but a good idea. I mean, despite the guy who obviously wrote it with the funny lie in the in the beginning, like obviously maybe he doesn't like I've androids, whatever it is. Bias. Uh, but this has only got to be something good, especially like depending on what the phone is, I guess, or what as long as it's running the newest operating system for Android. I mean, yeah. you can if you're a software developer, you can test your native apps and see if if you've made two for the separate platforms, how they interact on a physical device for a lot cheaper than buying two separate phones if you don't have them. And it's better than using like just emulators. But also like from from like my perspective as like a HF practitioner, this would be a great tool like if I wanted to test like let's say I wrote something in jQuery, wrote like a web app, and see how it works across both ah, yeah. uh, browsers on browsers maybe native to iPhone versus maybe a Chrome browser on Android, and see how people use them like out in real life, like doing a small little user test. Like I don't know, this is a great idea. I think I think it's cool. I would totally get one of these if I had um, if I had an iPhone because I uh, I love my Android. Any closing thoughts on our stories this week? Yeah, this is the last one. Much better than uh, gluing my Samsung to the back of my iPhone. So, there you go. Here we go. There you go. All right, well, that's it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for uh, news stories that you want us to cover, or games, or topics, or whatever, head on over to our Human Factors Facebook page, Human Factors Cast Facebook page. <laughs> we are posting all of our stuff on there now, so it's a great source for all of these articles and more. We'll also keep posting our show notes for you. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud. Reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. Again, we're more active there, so please engage. Or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com if you're shy. If you want to be really brave, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. Support us on our Patreon <laughs> and uh, become a D&D player with us at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes. Make them good. That's how we get more people. And uh, that's how we get the word out about Human Factors and Human Factors Cast. So we appreciate all those good reviews. Google Play Store is also a good place for us to find us. It's the end of the day. I am I'm burnt out, man. <laughs> it's all good. It's oh, a good man. way to end the podcast. Oh, man. All right. I, I got to delete this in the show notes because I said SoundCloud twice. <laughs> double or, SoundCloud. I know. Double SoundCloud all the way. Or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. I want to thank my panel of one, well, two. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you? You guys can get at me, as always, on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. And now you can get at me on Uptime, Uptime. at Don't Panic UX as well. Perfect. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Whoa. <laughs> the music went away. <laughs> We've lost the tunes. There we go. All right. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. I don't know what happened there with the music. It was... This is this is an ending, that's for sure. All right. Well, yeah, and if you add me on LinkedIn, be sure to let me know that you are a listener. Otherwise, I won't add you if I don't know you. All right. That's it for Human Factors today. 
Hey, we factor cast. Thanks for. <laughs> Bye, everybody. See you next week. It depends. It depends, indeed. Burgers and robots, and it depends, and uptime, and D and D and stuff. DM. D and D. Google. Yeah, it depends.